to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 6, where uh, we have been going through the book of Revelation in biblical prophecy um, for quite some time now. And uh, so the revelation of Jesus Christ. And as we have gone through the uh, book of Revelation, we have seen that there was a, an outline that Jesus presented in chapter 1, verse 19, where he told John that he was going to talk to him about the things that have been, the things that are, and the things that shall be. And so we began looking in chapter 1, and we saw how John was on the Isle of Patmos, and how he received the, um, the testimony of Jesus Christ concerning the things that would, would come about. And we saw that he actually saw Jesus Christ as well, and then he was given a message to the seven churches. And so we looked at each of those messages to the seven churches and spent quite a while going through those and applying them to our church. And then we saw that at the end of that, that we were going to get into the message about the things that shall be. And I, we took a hiatus, we took a little interlude, if you would, and began to look at biblical prophecy. And we, looked, we began all the way back at the feasts of Israel and how... Um, how the feasts were prophetic in and of themselves. We looked at the covenants that God had made. We looked at, as well, the, um, the prophecies that were given through Isaiah and through uh, Ezekiel and others as well. And so then we came back into the book of Revelation, and we began in Revelation chapter 4, looking at the throne room of God. And so as we looked at the throne room of God, we can saw the presence of God that was there and how, Jesus, how, how God was presented as, as this red and white color and how he was surrounded by this this rainbow that was emerald in color as well. He was surrounded by the four and twenty elders. Before him were the four living beasts. There was a sea of glass that was before him as well. And we saw that the worship and the praise that he received. And then we moved into chapter 5. And in chapter 5 we saw that proceeding from the, the throne, there was a lamb as though it had, had been slain. That this lamb that was proceeding from the throne was proceeding from the throne in order to take the, the scroll from the right hand of him who sat upon the throne. And so as John looked, we were told that there was nobody found worthy in, in heaven or in earth or under the earth. No one was found worthy to open up the scroll. And so John began to weep, but the, the elder came to him and said, Don't weep, because look, the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to open up the scroll. And so then he saw this lamb that was slain, who had seven eyes and seven horns, which were the seven spirits of God. And we know that that comes from Isaiah chapter 11, I think it is, Isaiah 11, where the sevenfold spirit of God. And so, so he comes, Jesus then comes, takes a scroll out of, out of the Father's hand, but he proceeds from the throne. And so we saw, coming through chapter 5, the deity of Jesus Christ over and over and over again. And then we saw the adoration that, that Christ received uh, because he had redeemed us to the Father. And so, from there we began to focus on that scroll. And we saw that the scroll having seven seals, the seal is a, was a, um, a sign of authority and that they would take wax and they would melt it on a document and they would place it with their signet ring and only the one who had that, that symbol, that signet, could open up that, that seal. And so we looked at the fact that the Darius, how Darius sealed the, um, the den of lions where, where Daniel was and only Darius could open it back up. That's why when Jesus died, they sealed the tomb when Jesus was placed into the tomb. That they came and they sealed it. But it didn't stop God, did it? Why? Because God outranks everybody. Isn't that awesome? I just, I just love that. I mean, that, that, it's, it's so small, you read it and you miss it. But it's so huge. Because what God was saying was, I outrank you. It doesn't matter what authority there is on earth, I outrank it. And so... Jesus then comes, this lamb that was slain, this lion of the tribe of Judah comes, and he begins to open up the seals. So what does it tell us? Again, that he must be God. Because he is the one who created the heavens and the earth. He's the one who owns the heavens and the earth. And so in Psalm 24, we read that the earth is Yahweh's. Now, I understand the earth is the Lord's and the fullness of the earth. But Bring into it what earth is Yahweh. And Yahweh says in the book of Isaiah, besides me there is no God. Yahweh says, I will not share my glory with another. And so when Jesus comes and he takes that scroll and he begins to open it up, he declares himself to be Yahweh. And in John chapter 8, 
we miss it so many times because at the very end of John chapter 8, we read, you know, Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. I am. And it's all capitalized in your Bibles, and you see it. And so we understand, he says, Yahweh. He says, in, in the Greek, it's ego and me. And so before Abraham was, I am. And, and they take up thro- st- thro- blah, 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 stones to throw at him. Right? And so we understand that Jesus was declaring himself to be Yahweh there. But there are four times throughout John chapter 8 that he actually declares himself to be Yahweh. And if you go through it, you'll look at it, and I think verse 24 is one of them, and it says, he says, I am, and then there's the word he, and he is in italicis, get rid of it. It wasn't there in the Greek, it's not there in the original, get rid of it. Jesus says, unless you believe that I am, I am, unless you believe ego and me, the same phrase that he used at the end of the chapter, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. I met with some uh, Mormon elders here a week ago, when was it they, last week? And, and I just try to drive that point home over and over and over. I mean, I'm, I'm blunt with them. You're either a worker of, the, worker of the devil or I am. You're either leading people to hell or I am. The, 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 the fact is that your gospel and my gospel is not the same gospel. Your Jesus and my Jesus are not the same Jesus. And the spirit that you're proclaiming is not the same spirit that I'm proclaiming. And they get mad. They get offended at it. But it's the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so it's so critical when Jesus begins to open up the scroll. He's not another created being. Which is what the Mormons would like to tell you. Which is what Jehovah's Witnesses would like to tell you. He is not another created being. Remember, there was no created being who was found worthy to open it up. And so when he comes, he opens it up and he proclaims by that very act that he is Yahweh. He is the creator God. And so as he then begins to open up those those seals, we saw that the first seal was the white horse, and the rider on a white horse, he had a bow in his hand, and he, and he, and he conquered the earth, he went out to conquer, and then following him was the, the red horse, and, and the rider on the red horse was given the power to take away the peace that was on the earth, and to, to kill, and then followed by him was the, the third seal, and the black horse, and then the fourth seal, and the pale horse, and the black horse, we spent time on last week, looking at, that in that, that financial earthquake, that financial devastation that was going to occur at that time, that it was going to be, it was defined by a quarter of wheat for a day's wages and a, and a quarter of barley, or three quarts of barley for a day's wages. And I, and I showed you what a quarter of wheat, I don't know if you, if you were here last week, if you remember that, what a quarter of wheat looks like, and how that grinds down into to not quite two quarts, somewhere between six and seven cups of flour. And it takes three cups of flour to make a loaf of bread, one loaf of bread. And so basically what we're talking about with beginning in July 24th, 2009, at least here in the United States. Now, I understand this is an American application. It's not worldwide at this moment. But at least here in the United States, taking the application, that minimum wage goes up to 725. That means on, at that time, a day's wages will be $60. So just taking the application here, that means that two loaves of bread will cost $60. 30 bucks a loaf. Okay? It's an amazing thing to think about. Now, whether it is by the U.S. economy, which I think the U.S. economy at that point isn't going to be what we picture it as today. We are so far in debt that all we've got to do is have somebody start to call into debt and we will look like Argentina overnight. When people call into debts, we talk about this, we have one of two options. You either print more money. What, what did you say, George? Give New Orleans. Or something. You folks from California, close your eyes for a second. Or give them California. Anyways, so, yeah. uh, anyways. But, no, you, you're one to you're either going to print more money, and that's what everybody does. You've got, because you've got your debt to pay, and so since you're not on the gold standard anymore, it doesn't matter whether you have any backing for it. They want a million of your dollars, so what do you do? You print it. And what does it do with the rest of the money? It devalues it. Amazing. It's, it's tremendous inflation that happens overnight. That, that is what many of the other countries have done that we've seen the total devastation. And overnight, a loaf of bread can cost a thousand whatevers. Okay? It's an amazing thing. Or the second option you have is to do what? War. Kill your enemy. <laughs> if he's collecting the debt, if he's dead, he can't collect it, right? So you go to war and you fight him. And you say, I'm not going to pay you the debt. Okay. <laughs> what? All right. All right, yeah. So anyways... So either way, you have devastation that we see that's going to occur. And so in chapter 8, we read about this this, um, 
devastation that's going to occur, whether it's because there's a famine as well, like a drought that's going on at the same time, I wouldn't put it past God, that as God pours out these things, that there's a drought at the same time as there is a financial earthquake. That leads to the fourth seal, which is death. Um, and we're told that when death comes and Hades following him, that he is given the power to kill, not only just with, through death itself, but through starvation, um, through killings. Uh, it's just an amazing uh, anarchy that's going to happen. This week, my dad, I wish I had this last week, and I knew how to embed YouTube videos. My dad sent me a video this week. A lot of times I, I don't watch everything people send me. There's just too much stuff. But this one caught my eye. It's called the, the American Form of Government. So I thought, okay, I'll go look at this thing. This is probably the best YouTube I've ever seen. I mean, every, all the other YouTubes are, you know, people are putting out there just for entertainment or for funny or whatever. This is educational. So your kids aren't going to want to watch it because it's educational, but make your kids watch it. It's great. It goes through the five forms of government, okay? It goes from monarchies to oligarchies to republics to demo democracies and anarchy. Okay? It could have been talking. Now, this guy never talks about whether he's a believer or not. Never talks about Jesus Christ. He's only talking about forms of government. And talking about how we were established as a republic, not a democracy. Democracy leads into anarchy. It's really amazing. It could, he could have been talking about the seals. I mean, it was toward the end of it. The girls were listening with me. And I, I turned to, my, to the girls and I said, does this sound like the seals? I mean, it was phenomenal. If, I wish I would have had it. I would have played at least the last excerpt in it. So if you get a chance, go on to YouTube and look for the one called American Form of Government. Daniel found it yesterday while we're doing the men's breakfast. And so it must be, not be that hard to find. It's the first one that pops up. Right? So you put American Form of Government? There you go. There you, so it's the first thing that pops up. It's about ten minutes long. Ten and a half minutes long. Oh yeah. It may have some images in it that may be disturbing to your children. Because as it talked about Nazism and fascism and, and all those kind of things, it, it showed about people putting guns to the heads and, and that kind of thing. But not, they didn't show the killing necessarily themselves, I don't think, but it's, anyways. So you just need to know, going into it, that it's educational. It's going to show this stuff. So anyway, so we went through those four seals, the, the four horsemen, and then we talked about the fifth seal. And the fifth seal was where we seal the martyrs, the martyrs of the faith, who were beneath the, the altar of sacrifice. And we talked about that altar of sacrifice being twofold, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, because when God looks at us, he looks at us through the blood of Jesus Christ. But also the, the sacrifice of their, of their, their own sacrifice. Um, because they had given themselves for the testimony of Jesus Christ and for the word of God. That they had died for it. And, and we saw them crying out, oh, how long, oh God, holy and true? And they were told what? Just a little while longer. Just wait. Here's a white robe. Put it on a while. But just wait. Why? Because there's more. There are more who are going to die for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And that's a, it's a powerful statement for me as I think about it, that God is in control. He's not out of control. These people weren't killed because God couldn't protect them. God allowed them to die for the testimony of Jesus Christ. In fact, God had planned that there would be even more who would die for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so it's on that and on the heels of that that we come into them. The sixth seal. And in the sixth seal, we see this, this catastrophe that's going to come upon the earth. Now, there were already catastrophes. I mean, it's just that they went quickly through with those horses. Okay? I mean, there was, there was conquering going on. There was wars going on. There, was, there were famines and droughts going on. Remember? And as we looked at the, the, the death, does anybody remember in, on the fourth horse how many people died? A, a fourth. And I showed you the, 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 the stuff from the CIA last week, that the CIA, how many people the CIA said there were on the earth, and that led to about 1.7 billion, I think, people. 1.6 and 1.7 billion people will die during the fourth seal. So, you know, we just kind of read through it, and we think nothing about it, but when you start to... Thank you, Matt. Yeah, I've got more of them up here if we run out. Do you need more of them back there? We have... We have you, you have more? We have a chart that we've been using as well, just to puts everything in perspective. Um, so anyways, 1.6 to 1.7 people will die during that fourth seal. And now we come into this sixth seal that is we see as catastrophic. And so here at the end of chapter 6, beginning at verse 12, we see it says, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs. And so the first thing we see is this 
this, the opening of the seal, and then this huge earthquake. And this earthquake comes, and, and the, when this earthquake happens, we're told that the, the sun becomes blackened, and then the moon turns red. And not only that, now all of a sudden there's what? Stars falling from the heavens to the earth, like, like fig trees uh, dropping its late figs, okay? Because they're, they're ready to fall. And so when a wind comes by, they just come, brrr, you know, it's kind of like, a, and down south we'd say it's like a pine tree, you know? Have you ever been around under, under a pine tree when the stiff breeze comes and all those pine cones are ready to fall? It's really not a good place to stand. Anyways, and so that's kind of what's happening. And then it's, we're told that the, sc- the sky, and this is this lady's picture um, of how the, the sky begins to recede like a scroll. It begins to roll back, okay? All these things are starting to occur um, that's here. But then we see the response of the people. How do the people who are living on the earth respond at this time? They hide. First of all, they hide. And secondly, they proclaim something. What are they proclaiming? Not the wrath of God, but the wrath of the the Lamb. Okay? And so, now understand, these are people on the earth proclaiming. These are the kings and everybody else who are hiding. Okay? And they're proclaiming, I think this is really interesting, that they understand the judgment of God. And they come and they say, this is the wrath of the Lamb. Now, some people, okay, have proclaimed that they believe that the rapture occurs right here. That because the, the sky is, is scrolling up, okay, because of the massive earthquake, and because the people, because they believe that we're not going to go through the wrath of God, okay, which I agree, I don't believe I'm going to go through the wrath of God, but they believe that the, the rapture occurs here because of what is now proclaimed in this last verse where the people on the earth are beginning to proclaim, woe is unto us, because now the wrath of the Lamb has come upon us. I've got one major dispute with this. And that is, say it again. I keep saying not It's people saying not God. And not, they're unbelievers who are saying it. They haven't got a clue. In other words, it's not God saying this is His wrath. We're, God told us when His wrath is going to be poured out. And those are called the bulls of wrath. Okay? So very clearly we're told when the wrath of God is being poured out. A bunch of people on the earth saying that this is the wrath of God doesn't make it the wrath of God. They ain't seen nothing yet. Okay? This is incredible what's going to happen here, but it's nothing yet. Now, on the heels of this, in chapter, um, beginning in chapter 7, we're told that there are four angels who come now. And the job of these four angels is to hold back the four winds from the earth until the, the chosen of God are sealed. Now, I'm going to just state it that way, because it's 144,000, because that, that's the next step that we're going to get into. And I want to talk about this just real briefly here, interpretation-wise. Okay? I've read a lot of things by a lot of people uh, on, on what they think this is. The best that I, I've read so far, and again, this is not biblical because God doesn't say exactly what's going to be. He says it's going to be a great earthquake. And coming from the great earthquake, are there going to be the other things? But someone proclaimed that they believe that this is going to be a nuclear holocaust. That this will be a nuclear explosion. You know, it's really interesting to me. Now, again, we like to interpret based upon the times that we live in. Right? So, who knows? This is going to be, you know... Something beyond a nuclear explosion, right? I mean, but I find it interesting that um, in Europe, they're still trying to, they have this big underground tunnel where they're trying to bash, um, what? Hedron Say it again? Hedron Collider. Hedron Collider. Okay, anyways, it goes beyond even the, the other stuff. I mean, and they're so worried about what's going to happen when, it, when, it, when they do it that they've tried to do this thing way down underneath. Okay? So it doesn't necessarily have to be the president of North Korea, who it could be, or the president of Iran, who it could be, or the president of any other rogue nation. It could be the president of the United States. I mean, who knows, right? But it could be just a scientific thing as well. Okay? I think, at this point, potentially it may be more of a, a warfare scenario, okay? Based upon the other things that are going to occur. I think the scenario of a nuclear explosion holds very well here 
because of what we're going to see when we get into the first four trumpets as well, um, which we're not going to get into today, but when we get into the trumpets, the fallout, quote-unquote, from a nuclear explosion seems to occur in those first four trumpets. And so what would you expect? Now, if you think about Mount St. Helen, okay? So go to Mount St. Helen, and if you were alive... <laughs> Mount St. Helen. I mean, it's amazing now for me. The order I get, I look at it and I say, of course everybody was there for Mount St. Helen, but I look at it and I go, no, probably over half the people here weren't alive when Mount St. Helen blew. But if, if you ever watched any of the movies about Mount St. Helen when it blew, does anybody remember what it was like in Washington at that time? Everything was covered with ash. Everything was covered with ash, with soot. What did it become like if you were there during the middle of the day? It got dark. It got dark. It became like nighttime, okay? And so the, the sun became black, and the moon would become like blood at that time. An interesting thing, okay? And that's just one volcano erupting. Could you imagine what the explosions now would be in some of our nuclear um, warheads? And what, the, what it would, the chaos it could create. Anyways... I think that that sounds like a, a very good explanation for all this. Now, what about the four, the four angels and the four winds? Whenever there is um, an explosion, let's, let's go back to my, Mount St. Helens, and it erupted, okay? And as the plume went up, it went straight up, and it came straight back down. Is that right? No, it spread out. It spread out, and it did what? And it traveled. And it traveled. And if you ever saw satellite images of it, how it went over multiple states and covered states with its plume. It was an amazing thing. Same thing will happen if there is a nuclear holocaust. That it's not just the people who are um, there. I mean, I'd rather, for example, like we talk about SRS being one of the primary targets. It's okay. I like the fact that I'm at the epicenter. I mean, because if, if, it, if it gets hit, you won't know it. I mean, next thing you'll know, you'll be with the Lord, right? So, epicenter, you're gone. You don't have to live in through the, uh, the, 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 uh, the aftermath of it all. But, let's say SRS is hit. Who has to worry about it? All of South Carolina, okay? And then, whoever's in the, the Atlantic Ocean and, and beyond that, okay? Because all that nuclear stuff is going to be heading to the east unless there's a wind going the other way. And, do you ever watch a balloon race? Everybody, everybody watch a balloon race? It's a fun thing. We were in St. Louis years ago, and they had this big, I think it was like 50 balloons. It was just phenomenal. The color of all the balloons going up was just neat. But they begin to go up, and what they do is they do a, a, a rabbit in a, let's see, what do they call it, the rabbit in the, in the hounds, I guess. Anyways, the rabbit goes off first, okay, and it takes off, and then they give it about 15, 20 minutes, and then all the chase balloons get to go. But what they do is they go up, they go up in steps. They'll go up 100 feet, and they'll stop. And they'll see which way the balloons, the, the wind's blowing. And then they'll mark that. And then they'll, go, they'll step up, they'll step up, they'll step up, they'll step up. Because at each level, the winds are, blowing they're blowing in different directions. And so as they go out and they see the rabbit out there, the rabbit's heading this way, they know they've got to drop a couple hundred feet so they get to the, the wind that's going to push them that way. Or the, the rabbit starts going that way, they've got to jump, go, go back up. And so the, the balloons will they'll continue to change their elevation so that they can change which direction they're going based upon the, the wind currents that are there. So now, again, picture that in the context of a nuclear holocaust that's going on and the dispersion that's happening with all that radio. So, so you have the four angels holding back the four winds until God can consecrate, until God can seal this 144,000. Why? Because these 144,000 are not going to be allowed to be touched by what's going to come next. And so we have next the consecration of this 144,000. Excuse me, 144,000. And in this consecration of the 144,000, the first thing we see is their identity. Who does the Bible say that they are? It declares literally that they are 144,000, quote, of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Okay? Now, there are many people who like to spiritualize this. The Jehovah Witnesses like to say that this really isn't the, the, the tribes of Israel, but this is representative of, no, not even the church, 
only 144,000 of Jehovah's Witnesses. And the sad thing is that they proclaimed that that already happened back in the 1930s. So I don't get all these Jehovah's Witnesses, they come to your door, they don't want to go to heaven. They want to live here because they know that there can't be more than 144,000 in heaven. It's just an amazing thing. Anyways, they need to read their Bible. I just, I always want to take them back to the Word and go, just please read what it says. I mean, it's, you know, it's just amazing. But there are also Christians, quote unquote, who look at the Word and like to allegorize Revelation and not take it literally. And they like to say that this refers to the church. So 144,000 is a, is a number of perfection. You know, it's 12,000, 12, 12, so it's, this, it's just showing a, a large number. And I disagree with this because right on the heels of this, we're going to see the great multitude. Well, the great multitude is from beyond Israel. Okay? It's not from the church. It's from all nations. And that's us. Okay? And so there is these two groupings that we're talking about. Now, one thing I do want to point out, because okay, I do believe this is literally 12 or 144,000 Jews. Okay? But we don't see the tribe of Dan mentioned. Now, it did tell us that it was 12,000 from what? All the tribes of the children of Israel. However, as it goes through and it says 12,000 from the tribe of Judah, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of this, Levi and Simeon and Benjamin. It says 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh and it says 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph. The tribe of Dan is never mentioned. However, we know from the book of Ezekiel and elsewhere that the tribe of Dan will be in the millennium. That they will be there when Christ reigns on the earth. Why are they not mentioned here? Because clearly, Joseph had two sons who were used, right? Manasseh and Ephraim. Now, who was of those two who received the blessing of Joseph? Manasseh or Ephraim? Bible, talk, Bible knowledge test time. Come on now. Who received the blessing from Joseph? Manasseh or Ephraim? you got a 50% chance. Take a coin out. Flip it. No. Well, from Jacob, but it's through Joseph. Because Joseph said, no. Oh, that's true. You're right. I am messing that up, ain't I? Because Joseph, Joseph said, no, Father. Here's the oldest. You're right. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm messing it up a little bit, too. But Jacob, Jacob actually did the blessing. That's right. But it was the younger. Who was the younger? Ephraim. Ephraim. Good. That's exactly right. It, but here, Ephraim is not what? Mentioned either. Manasseh is mentioned, and then Joseph. And so there are pe many people who like to build a theology based upon the two missing tribes that are here, Dan and, and Ephraim. Why are, these two, why are these two missing? Well, first of all, I think that Ephraim is, is equated with Joseph. I think Joseph is equated with Ephraim. I think that was always the, the, the fact. When they talked about the tribe of Joseph, it was always Ephraim. Now, it is a potential, though, that I wish Timmy was here, because as I was going through this last night, Timmy was sitting beside me on the, the couch, and he saw this one, and he saw the tribe of Dan was missing, and Timmy said to me, this, I, this is one of those times you go, maybe I'm doing something right after all. Anyways, he said to me, he says, Dad, the tribe of Dan's missing? I said, yeah. And he says, well, is that because that they took the idols in the days of Micah. Now, maybe he was just reading it in the morning or whatever, and he just was fresh in his mind. I don't know. But I said, yeah, that's exactly what many people conjecture, is that it was the tribe of Dan that wasn't satisfied with their lot, with their heritage, their inheritance in the land, remember? And they went north. And as they went north, they went to the, the house of Micah, and they grabbed Micah to be their own priest, and they grabbed the idols, the icons that were in the house to be set up as their gods. And so they had this Levite kid be their priest with all their icons. And so they were the first of the, the tribes to go into idolatry. Now, is that why they're not here? I don't know. I honestly don't know why they're not here. God didn't tell us why he didn't put them in there. Okay? So that's all what? Conjecture. Okay? And so when it's conjecture, let's proclaim it as conjecture. When it's, when it's biblical, let's call it, let's, let's, let's state it's biblical. Okay? So I don't know why they're not here, but they're not here. But what we are told on the other side, though, is that there's 12,000 from all what? All the tribes. All the tribes. So we do know that God did not turn his, his face away from the tribe of Dan, because we know that they're going to be there in millennium. However, 
one makes one does wonder, okay, whether this is a little bit of a punishment to those of the tribe of Dan. And just remember that sin, we talk about this all the time, sin has what? Consequences. And sometimes its consequence isn't immediate. Sometimes that consequence comes years down the road. I may be breeding something into my child that comes out in them in uh, just brilliant colors, not beautiful colors, but, you know, it just comes out in their life, and then it, as I look at my grandchildren, it'll be really nasty. And it'll be because of my own sin. And, and so, maybe it's one of those things. So we see their identity. Secondly, we see their seal. They're sealed on their, their foreheads. Okay? And we're told that they're given this seal. And in this seal, it's so that they cannot be touched by anything. Now, this is important. This sealing that's here, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to mark them as being one who is separated by God. Now, at this point, we're not told that they're believers. Okay? Because take this with what we're going to be looking at in the multitude at this moment. The multitudes are those who proclaim the, the, the blood of Jesus Christ. These 12,000 from each of the tribe have not yet at this point, we're not to, are not told that they are believers. But rather, they are going to be, I think, become believers. And God is sealing them because they are going to be his witnesses during the final week of Daniel's vision. The 70th week that we're getting ready to go into. They will be the witnesses that we again see in Revelation chapter 14. So, they're sealed on the forehead. They're not believers at this point. Believers are already sealed. Now, this is exciting. Because as we look at this, we say, no, wait a second. We've talked about the fact that probably the rapture, the raptoro, the, the we know from the Greek, the harpazo, didn't occur in Revelation chapter 4, like the traditional view is. For, um, for others' sake, I am pre-tribulational in my belief, but I'm not traditionally pre-tribulational. Okay? I believe the tribulation period is the, the final week of Daniel's vision, the 70th week. That doesn't occur to Revelation chapter 11. I don't think the church will be there, but that doesn't mean it has to be gone in Revelation chapter 4 if, if the Bible doesn't state that it's there. I think the Bible is clear about where the, the rapture or the taking of the church happens. Well, we're not there yet. We'll get there. And, and, okay? And I'll, I'll be very clear when I state where I think it is, but even because I think it's there doesn't mean it's going to necessarily have to be there, right? It'll be wherever God's determined it's going to be. But in Revelation 4, we don't see anything of the description of what Paul says is going to be, it's going to be there. With the, the shout, the, Jesus coming in the clouds, the, the, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet, the last trumpet. It, none of that's there in Revelation 4. So I don't think it's there. I clearly don't think it's a part of the sixth seal because a bunch of unbelievers declare that it's going to be the wrath of the Lamb when it's not the wrath of the Lamb. Okay, so this being the case then, Okay, I have to understand this, and I have to ask myself the question, and as I go through it, I go, well, wait a second. If potentially the church, potentially the church or some believers, okay, who are not the martyrs of chapter, the fifth seal, are going through this point, what about them? I mean, these 144,000 Jews, they're being sealed, so they're not touched, right? What about believers? Well, the fact is we know from the book of Ephesians that if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the minute you trust in him, what happens to you? sealed. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You don't have to be sealed right here. Do you know why? You already are. And so if you're worried about not being sealed right here, I'm telling you, get saved. Okay? If, you, if you're not one of these 144,000 Jews who have never touched a woman, okay, for me, it's, it's you know, I, I have seven immaculate, you know, conceptions. I mean, I know that you know, I didn't touch my wife, and so I might be one of those Jews. Anyways, no, it's not me. So the reality is, I mean, look at people. I go, you're not going to be one of those 144,000 Jews. And so if you want to be sealed going through this stuff, come to Jesus. I mean, that's, that's one of the best ways to know what's going to happen as you come through this stuff. So we have the believers already sealed. Now, we have the consecration of 144,000 here, but in heaven at the same time, we've got this great multitude that we're told about as well. And we see this consecration of the setting apart of this multitude that is there. In this multitude, we see, first of all, their numbers. We're told that it is a, a, a number that is really innumerable. It is unable to be numbered. When 
God spoke to Abraham, and he gave Abraham the blessing. You remember back then? What did he tell him about his descendants? It would be like the stars in the sky, the sand of the seashore. He said, look to the sky. Count the stars if you're what? If you're able. Now, you know, I don't know about you, but I go outside in my street, and I look up, and I say, man, I can count that. It may take me a while, but I can count those. But I challenge you to go to Canada with me sometime. Or if you've ever been, I'm looking at you, Lawrence, out in the desert where there's no light. Go one of those, yeah, Afghanistan or whatever. You know, go one of those places where you don't have the street lights. You know, it's wonderful being 26 miles upriver up in Canada. There is no lights other than the northern lights. And you look up there, and you know what you're just awed by? How many lights there are. And you start to think, no, I don't think I could do that. I mean, you know, just think about how many there are in this little capsule of the sky that I'm looking at right now, and it's going to what? There it's going to continue to rotate, and how many stars there are out there. It's just nuts. And then you think about the, um, the, the sand of the seashore, and I think of the, the grain that was in my, my, my court. Did I share last week the little tidbit there? How many, uh, I think I did, how, how, many, how many grains did they plant in one acre of wheat? It's between 1 and 1.4 million kernels of wheat is planted in one acre. For every acre um, is 1 to 1.4 million kernels. Could you imagine that? I mean, 1 to 1.4 million. I mean, it's, so in my mind, it's like saying, you know, go and count the, the kernels of grain that are planted in that 100 acre plot. You know? Just phenomenal. And so that's this, that's this multitude that's there. The numbers are just innumerable. Their origins. Where does it say that they're from? Where does from what? Every nation. That's the word ethnos. Remember we talked about ethnos is where we get our word ethnicity. Okay? And so it's from every ethnic group. All tribes. This is the same word that's used with the tribes of Israel. So it's talked about um, offshoots, if you would. So these are kind of like the, not the, the main uh, nations, not the main ethnicities, but the ones that are kind of blends. You know, we're not quite sure which ones they fit into. God hasn't missed out on those guys. They're here. Okay? The, all peoples, the Laos, remember the, the, the nation of Laos is, is this word. The, all people groups and all tongues. And it's not all tongues, but rather we understand that the word tongue actually means language in the Greek. Lips means dialect, tongue means language. So people of every language. This is a phenomenal picture for me. When you talk about what the church really is. We believe in the, the autonomy of the local church. But the reality is that the church goes beyond our little grouping. The church goes beyond the grouping we may get in Augusta. The church goes beyond the grouping we may get in the state of Georgia. The church goes beyond what we may get in the United States. It is every ethnicity, every offshoot of people, every language, every, um, and every um, grouping of people that are out there is going to have some representative. Isn't that awesome? The, the tribes in Africa, the tribes, the aborigines down in Australia, the, the, the different fashions, the different um, groups going in the, in the Muslim worlds as you look at the, the Arabic world and how they have all their little tribes and everything that are there. God says, I'm going to have a representative from every one of them that's there praising my name. What's their position? What are we, what are we told? Where are they at at this time? They're standing before the throne. Now, I think it's neat. They're standing before the throne. Now, understand words are important. Every place else we see the four and twenty elders and the, the four living creatures, they're doing what? They're bowing down and they're getting ready to bow down again in just a moment, right? They're going to fall flat in their face. And so, but these guys, these people are standing. This is incredible to me because I have no right in and of myself to stand in the presence of God. Who is God? He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He is holy, holy, holy. And when Isaiah saw him, what did Isaiah say? Woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst people of unclean lips. But yet these people, these believers from all these tribes, they're going to be able to go into the presence of God and do what? Stand. Why? Because their appearance what are they wearing? White robes. What about the white robes? Where do they come from? They were cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. And that gives them the, the right 
that gives you and me the per, the permission. The um, say it again. Privilege. The privilege. That's this word. Thank you. The privilege to stand in the presence of God. Isn't that awesome? Now listen. I deserve. I need to bow. I need to bow before God. Recognition of who He is. But I have the right. Do you get it? I have the privilege to stand because I'm not only a servant, I am also his, his son. I'm his child. We're told in Ephesians chapter 4 that when Jesus Christ came, he came to do what? Redeem me to him so that I could have what from the book of Ephesians? An adoption. And I can be called a son of God. Isn't that awesome? And the son, think about it, a son doesn't need to what? Bow. Now, my kids should honor me. They should reverence me. But they don't have to bow in my presence all the time. Now, we do teach them they should, they should rise in the presence of the hoary head. And so, you know, as my head gets more hoarier, more whiter, I expect that as I come into the house every day, they're going to be standing up all the time. Anyways, but um, the, the fact is that these... They're able to stand because they have these robes which have been given to them through the cleansing of the blood of Christ. And then we go into their worship. Note what they state in their worship. Um, beginning verse 10 it says, And they cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne, even to the Lamb. Now I know it says and to the Lamb, but the Greek word kai many times means even. It's a comparative and we saw, where did the lamb come from? The midst of the throne. He was the one on the throne. And so the, the, the God and the lamb are one and the same, and yet we see them in two distinct ways. But so salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and even to the lamb. And then, in the midst of their worship, in the midst of their crying out to God, they're joined. So here you've got this great multitude that's not being able to number, right? And now this great multitude is not being able to be numbered is being joined by this angelic choir which is probably not being able to be numbered right and these in the four and twenty elders in the four living creatures and they're all joining together in this praise of god and all these angels and all these elders and the four living creatures are all falling on their face verse 11 falling literally falling on their face before the throne and they're worshiping God, which is the word uh, pr um, proskuneo, which means to fall prostrate. And so we talked about this in the past. Not that I want you to become Muslims, but Muslims got this right. Okay? It means to come down on your face before God and humble yourself, prostrate yourself before God. That's what the word worship literally means. We have a hard time getting on our knees before God. Now, Allah is not the true God by any stretch of the imagination. He's a false God. He's a demon God. But it's a sad thing when those who worship a false God got it down pat. I challenge you, if you don't get on your knees before the Lord, at times you don't have to do it all the time. That becomes legalistic and you're only doing it for the wrong reason. But take some time to humble yourself before God and get on your knees. I remember a man years ago, Roger Davis, some of you might know that name, um, told me, he said, you know, we were talking about something, he says, you know, I know what my problem is, Pastor Bob, I said, what's that? He says, I'm not wearing out the knees of my pants. I says, you're exactly right. We need to be wearing out the knees of our pants. And uh, we need to be getting on our, our, our face before the Lord. It's amazing that they don't have a problem with that when they're in his presence. They've got it all down pat. Worship means worship. Worship means humbling our myself before the Almighty God in recognition of who He is. And so, what a, what a glorious picture. Believers, believers begin to praise God. Right? And what happens? The angelic choir joins in. I don't think it's only in heaven. I think it can start here too. Worship is so important. Their identity. Now we're told who they are at the end of all this. And because we're told in verse 13, then one of the elders answered and said to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? I said, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, there are some, this is a teaching point here, there are some who say then 
this has got to be clearly after, this seal has clearly got to be after the seven years. Because that's the Great Tribulation, right? So the, the, the final seven years of, of Daniel's vision is the Great Tribulation period. And so therefore, these, these people are coming, the ones who are coming out of the Great Tribulation. And so therefore, this sixth seal has got to be after the seven. And so the seals, the trumpets, and the bulls have got to be simultaneous rather than sequential. Okay? There's a couple problems with that. First of all, deal with the, the simultaneous versus sequential. They are not, and I see some of the patterns here, okay? And, I, and there was a period where I, str I would struggle with some of that, you know, kind of seeing it. It cannot be simultaneous because the trumpets very clearly come out of the seventh seal, okay? And so, and some of the things that they like to, to place as a pattern, and this looks like this, is one of the things that happens on the first trumpet, right at the, the, uh, the introduction of the first trumpet. And they like to put that with the seals, and you can't do that because the, the trumpets were given as part of the seventh seal, okay? Also, the, the final week of Daniel's vision, the, se the 70th week, occurs when the seventh trumpet was about to sound. So, in the transition period between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet is the beginning of Daniel's 70th week. Well, that doesn't hold then because that would have been earlier. Okay, so there's just a lot of things that are wrong with saying that they have, that the seals are happening at the same time as the trumpets are happening at the same time as the bowls of wrath. Okay, it doesn't hold that way. But, so you've got to come back and say to yourself, then what's this great tribulation? I mean, this is, isn't this the great tribulation that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24? Let's go back to Matthew 24 real quick. And if you have the, um, the other sheet that I gave out a couple weeks ago, um, the, um, the, ch the chart where I have the synopsis, the harmony um, of the different passages in the Bible and how they come together with the book of Revelation, you'll see this on there as well. And I will, again, be continually updating the web with these things. I, I, I still can't get the, the, the sermons to go up. The, the, um, the speed is just nuts from the... I've got to find a new, a new place to, to put the website. Um, but anyways, I'll continually put the charts up there, though. And even if we can't get the, the sound bites to go up as well. But in Matthew 24, when Jesus is talking about the tribulation stuff... He talks about, in Matthew 24, verse 21, he says, For then there will be, what? Great tribulation. Okay? Great tribulation. Such has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And then down, drop down to verse 29, we read, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. You say, wow, that sounds like the sixth deal, doesn't it? Okay? Now, it doesn't have to be the sixth seal. Yes, it sounds like some of the things that are happening in the sixth seal, but it doesn't have to be necessarily the sixth seal. Okay? There are other things we're going to see as we go through that there are devastating things that happen. Now, why do I think that it cannot be them, them that are there? Well, because of the fact that we're told that these things are going to occur after verse 15. Right? Look at verse 15. Therefore, when you see what? The abomination of the desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and those who are in the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Da -da 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 -da. Okay, Jesus says that these things that are going to occur, that he, that he talks about the great tribulation, occur after the abomination of desolation that Daniel talked about. Now you've got to take back in your mind. Remember I said as we came through all these things, you've got to kind of put all these biblical prophecies, put them back in your mind, because they all build. And in, in Daniel chapter 12... We're told that this abomination, abomination of desolation is going to occur after the first three and a half years of the final week. That occurs in Revelation chapter 11, not in Revelation chapter 6. Now, what it literally says is that there is going to be this mighty trial period, this mighty tribulation period. It is amazing, I challenge you to go through, take your e-sword, okay, and do a search on where the word tribulation or thiphthys comes from, okay, and that's the Greek word, okay, you do the search on the, on the, on the um, Strong's number and look every place it comes up. All those tribulations, okay, predominantly talk about tribulation to us, 
Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Why? I have overcome the world. And, and we can go on and on, but because of time, I don't, I don't um, want to go on it, but I've got the, all the references that are here okay, for these tribulations. And it's an amazing thing that all these tribulations talk about how we as believers in the world are going to go through these mighty tribulations. So, I come back to Revelation 6 and I say, I look at these saints in Revelation 7, I look at these saints and I go, what great tribulation did these believers just come through? You tell me. Did they just, I mean, here in Revelation 7, comes on the heels of Revelation 6, yeah? Okay, makes sense, okay. Was there any tribulation happening? Any really tumultuous time going on? Sure, there were wars by the nations. People were killing each other. There was a, a, a massive financial earthquake where there was um, uh, starvation and everything going on. There's a nuclear holocaust or something going on, even in the sixth seal, right? There's just massive tribulation happening. And so these people are the ones who are coming through this. Now, I don't know about you, but there are people in the world today we don't get, have a right picture. You can go to other countries, and guess what? There are believers who are walking through tribulation every day. They're being arrested for their faith. They're, they're, they have enough to eat, but they don't eat like you and I eat. And they come through great tribulation. We're told in one of the passages, I think it's in Acts 17, I think it was, where Paul was going back to the churches, and, he, and they're warning the churches that it that they, they must enter the kingdom through great tribulations, through much tribulation. And so it's through much tribulation that you enter into the kingdom of God, is what they tell them. There is going to be the trying of your faith. Do you remember when we talked about this with Dachamas? The word Dachamas and Ah Dachamas? Okay, Dachamas is to be proven genuine, okay, to be tested, to be seen genuine, okay? And so we're told as believers that whether you are to be found genuine, to be found dokamos, you've got to go through the trying of your faith. It's just a fact. So, that's going to happen. So, these, these ones are going to come through this thing. And what's their great reward? <laughs> First of all, they stand in the presence of God. They have the white robe, right? But we're also told that they are before Him, okay? To serve God in His temple. I just... You know, I think of David. You know, better is one day in your house than thousands elsewhere. I mean, this is my desire, is to be in the presence of God all the time. I, I look forward to the day that I die. I don't look forward to the process of death. You know, I mean, I, I've never gone through that process before. I don't know about you, so I'm not, I don't like the unknown. And so, I, I'm, but I look forward to the day that I'm there. Does that make sense? That is going to be an awesome time. And so we see this consecration. So, I bring all this together and I ask myself, as I ask you, how well do you traverse the tribulations of life? Tribulations occur all the time. Not just in the book of Revelation. How well are you going through the ones that you're experiencing right now? Are you spiritually prepared for the end time struggles? The reality is that the tribulations that are going to happen then are a whole lot greater than what you have right now. Now, if I am raptured, if I'm harpazoed in Revelation chapter 4, and I don't have to go through any of that, praise God. I'm very good with it. But you know what? If it doesn't happen there, I better be ready to go through some of these other things. And like we talked about yesterday morning with the men's breakfast, the reality is, in order for me to be stronger 10 days from now, I need to do, start doing what now? I need to start exercising now. I can't expect to have strength now when I haven't been exercising. I need to be ready to go through the struggles. And so, the time to prepare is now. Are you redeeming the time? Are you using the gift of tribulation that God has given you now to prepare you for what's going to come later on. Let's pray.
Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your love. Lord, I know that you have said in your word that you will not allow us to be tempted or tried beyond what we're able to bear. But that you will, with each trial, temptation, make a way to escape. Lord, I know that you said that you think that I can put up with it. And I praise you for it. I just pray that we would have our eyes focused upon you, that we would learn like Paul learned, the secret of contentment. That whether we are based or whether we are bound, whether we are full or suffer need, that we can say we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Lord, I pray that we would be like the cities that are set upon a hill whose light cannot be hid. We would be like the salt that has not lost its flavor. Rather, Lord, that we would be those used by your, your glorious hand to be an impact upon those that are about us. Lord, I pray that our speech and our actions would be salted with your presence. And Lord, that we would help prepare not only ourselves and not only our families, but others that are about us for the days that are coming, which we may be sitting on the threshold of. Be glorified, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn to 771 in our hymnals.